Okay, awesome. Everyone hear me? So I'm Susan, I'm the Director of Asset Development here at the Allen Institute for Cell Science, and I'm incredibly happy to see all of you here. We're very excited about this event. So I'm gonna pick up where um, the previous team talk left off, which is that we have this wonderful collection of cells that we're making, and uh, my job is to tell you a little bit about what we see in these cells as we look at them when we do the QC and when we make sure that they grow and they divide. We're also cell biologists, so we notice things. And these cells are cells that haven't been studied in detail for their cell biology in the, un, you know, the undifferentiated state. So we want to give you a little bit of a taste about what we notice in these cells. And I'm going to focus on two aspects of the biology. One is the fact that these cells seem to be organized like epithelial sheets. And the other is what happens when the cells divide. So here are our undifferentiated stem cells. We will be studying the differentiated cardiomyocytes as well, but here we're starting with the undifferentiated cells. They grow in beautiful colonies. They're very dynamic. You can see the colonies spudding as they divide. Um, and when you look more closely at these cells, so you label, say, the nucleus and the plasma membrane with dyes, and you look at the mitochondria, you can see that um, as you go through the cells in 3D, you start with um, sort of cells sitting on top of each other, on top of each other's feet. They're very, very closely packed. They're very, very three-dimensional. Um, the nucleus takes up about 50% of the volume of the cell, and then a lot of the organelles sit right on top. So um, the cells are about 10 to 20 microns tall, depending on exactly where they are in their packing, and they're 5 to 20 microns in diameter, depending on how you measure. So if you now look at, say, some cytoskeletal structure, filamentous actin. As we go through the cell in Z, again, we started at the bottom. You can see sort of actin stus fibers as you would expect near the bottom of the cell. You see some localization of filamentous actin throughout, and then you see the actin belt right at the top of the cell, very indicative of an epithelial cell. And if you look at this in 3D, you can see that again right here. And um, now the question is, of course, you would expect to see some other structures localized in the same manner. So if we take gene-edited cells for beta-actin, you can see the same thing. You can see the actin belt in just a moment. This you would expect. And if you look at myosin 2b, you can similarly see that myosin is present in the stus fibers in the bottom and at that belt on the top. You'll also notice that myosin looks a little bit different. And um, these movies do go fast, so I'm going to show you a still picture in a second. So you can see the um, alpha actinin and the actin, including at the um, you know, protrusions of the cells light at the bottom. And you can see the myosin's not there. And you can see the sort of striated pattern of the myosin in the stress fibers. And you can see the beautiful actin-myosin belt that's near the top of the cell. So that's actin. What else? So um, you already saw this movie. And you should not be seeing anything, so don't worry. All of a sudden, you're going to start seeing these little dots, which are the desmosomes that are labeled by desmoplakin, and they again appear right at the cell-cell junctions near the um, uh, apical surface of the cell. And here you can see uh, tight junction protein, or ZO1, doing the same thing. You can also notice how incredibly clear our signal is, because we don't have any other um, you know, protein in the cell other than the endogenously tagged protein. And another sort of hallmark of what epithelial cells would have is you would have the microtubules um, organized sort of from the top, coming down in parallel towards the bottom. And you can see that when we actually come from the bottom up, when you're near the center of the cell, you'll start seeing little dots that represent microtubule bundles. And if you put the cell sort of on its side, you can see the organization of the microtubules at the top. And then they're sort of coming down towards the bottom and then splaying out again. And then what you would also expect to see, oh, I wanted to point out two other really cool things you can notice right as we get to the top. These little creatures here are actually the mid-bodies as the cells separate. And then you'll see a couple of little dots that stick around. And those, for those of you who know, are, you can see them right here, the primary cilia that sit at the top of the cell. Again, a very nice hallmark of um, epithelial cells. You can see a teeny tiny one here, and you can see two right here. These are two different cells. So um, that's sort of the overview of how the cells are structured from ba uh, basal to apical and the structures that you see. And now, um, you know, as we're looking at these cells, and we're looking at them dynamically, the thing that, of course, strikes you first is what the cells look like as they go and divide. So even without fluorescence, you can see these cells dividing beautifully. Um, this is near the top of the colony. The cells kind of come up, and they sort of um, sit on top, and then they come back down. 
So they do divide within the plane, but much more rarely than they do by sort of popping up and down in the epithelial um, colony. So you've seen lots of pictures of this already today. Um, here is what a um, dividing iPS cell looks like when it's tagged with tubulin. Uh, you can see the dynamics beautifully. This is again near the top of the, the, top of the um, cells. And so all of these are sort of the tops of the other cells around this particular dividing cell. You can look at this at the level of the colony too. Then you can get spectacular movies um, of the whole colony dividing and growing. And you'll notice a couple of cool things. Um, or I'll notice a couple of cool things. One is that when I showed this to Rick, he said, oh my goodness, they look like they're synchronized. And that's true, you can see these sorts of pockets of division. It doesn't mean that there's some active synchronization going on, but if you start to think about it, if you had two cells that divided and they're a little bit more synchronized in their cell cycle and then they're gonna divide, you would see sort of pockets of cells that were sort of related to each other, dividing perhaps more closely in time than other parts of the colony. The other thing you can notice is if you watch any of these, um, you'll see these sort of lines and bundles that go between cells. And if you follow them closely, this is often the case because the cell divides and it doesn't seem to totally let go of that other cell that it was with. And the cells can move really far distances. So you can watch nuclei, you can watch these cells sort of shifting position and really mixing that colony. And analyzing where these cells go and when they divide and all of that is gonna be lots of fun for everyone. So you can see that also um, if you start looking at the dynamics of the nucleus. So here is lamin B1, nuclear envelope. And you should notice several things. I mean, you can just notice everything from these movies. You, you'll see the little pockets of division. You'll see the rearrangements of um, the nuclear envelope as the cells go through mitosis. You'll notice a couple of things, like the cell that has this weird sort of imaginations going on in the center of it. Um, it usually turns into a cell that then divides. And if we look a little bit more closely, you can see that the nuclear lamina reforms beautifully after the cells divide. And you can notice that right at the beginning, before division, that you still see something that looks nuclear, nuclear lamina-like. So it's known, of course, that the um, nuclear membrane proteins will go into the ER, and that cytoplasmic proteins will go into the cytoplasm. Lamin is, you know, a very filamentous meshwork, and it doesn't seem to disintegrate completely. Um, in fact, lamin V1 is known to perhaps, if you look very closely, it's sort of hard to see here, but there's known to be some lamin B1 that's still associated even with the spindle to help for spindle formation for the spindle matrix. Um, and these structures look beautiful if you look at them in 3D. I'm just showing you a 2D slice right now. So um, here's one of my new favorite structures in the cell, the nucleolus. Um, and that's because the nucleolus is you know, strongly associated in its shape and its changes in shape with um, how cells differentiate or how cells become cancerous. But it's also very cool because it's lately been shown that in certain systems, the nucleoli, which are membrane-less bound sort of protein RNA structures where active transcription and translation occur, um, they can change their properties just based on uh, phase transitions depending on the concentration of proteins within the nucleus. So this is actually in C. elegans. You can see sort of um, what happens, here's sort of a model, both in a single cell and in multiple cells, and this is the same fibrillarin that you're gonna see here in a second. And you'll notice that what happens is the nucleoli sort of um, fall apart, and then they start building together again in the cell cycle, and then they fall apart again. And at least in C. elegans, this can be actually explained just by the sort of cool new cell biology of phase transitions that's, that people are studying. In our cells, um, you can see some of that. You have to look a little closely. You can see cells dividing, and they have a uh, few different, uh, several, several nucleoli that then coalesce into fewer. But again, this is very low mag. So if we look at these in the high mag, a lot of stuff is gonna happen now. The, a couple of these cells are gonna divide. You can see that process happen again. And if you, when it loops, if you pay really close attention, and I will show you the picture, oops, it happened right there. If you line it up, what you'll notice is actually that the nuclei will look like this. They have a lot more structure than you see in, say, C. elegans. They have more structure. That's been known to see, say, in adult uh, uh, C. elegans as well. Um, and then they seem to do this funny melting, and the nucleus is still really large. So this is just a subregion of the nucleus where the nucleolar structure changes. Then, they, um, then the, the fibrillarin becomes invisible. It's still there. So if you up the contrast, you can still see it. And then slowly you can see a reassembly from many small into fewer large nucleoli. But um, I called my friend who studies nucleoli up because this was so unusual to me. And um, we still have to dig through the literature, so if any of you know, let us know. But this very, very transient step that happens in all of the cells before they divide, where you see the structure sort of melt, um, could be perhaps 
the stem cell version of that phase transition. A lot of the other steps here are not consistent with the idea that it's just the concentration of the protein that's changing the nucleoli. So I know I'm talking a lot about nucleoli, but that's just because this was one observation that was just super cool and interesting. So that, that's it. That's our little tour of um, what happens in these cells and what they look like and introduce you to them. Hopefully many of you will get to know these cells much more intimately than, than we do right now. And I just want to thank um, everyone at the Al Institute for Cell Science. And um, in our next team talk, you will see a little bit about what we're doing with these cells um, to answer some interesting questions in cell biology. Thanks. We have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has any yes. questions for Susan. We're just still in awe of all your pretty pictures. <laughs> Does anybody know about this nuclear melting? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Does anybody know about the lamin not disassembling completely and want to tell us something about that? Okay. <laughs> well, if you do know and you're just being shy, please find me because we want to talk about it. Yes, thank you. <laughs>